first kickoff webinar of 2020. So thanks for joining Advanced Cooling Technologies. Uh, I'm excited. I think you have a good webinar in store today. So I'll hand it over to uh, a couple of stars in the HVAC energy recovery area. Um, but first, just to get you started and orient you with what we'll be covering today. Um, the two gentlemen that will be giving the presentation are Mark Stevens and Devin Pellicone. And as I mentioned, these are, are two of the stars in the HVAC energy recovery area. Mark's been on board with ACT for over 10 years, and he's been um, kind of a catalyst in getting us started in this industry and has a lot of experience with these, these products and the um, logistics associated with getting these um, fulfilled into um, new construction projects and working with engineering firms to get these designed in. Um, and then Devin is our lead engineer, and he has been um, kind of a, a leader in all things um, pumped and passive two-phase. So is very familiar with not only our HVAC product line, but also a lot of our industrial products that feature those type of technologies. So you're in good hands today, and uh, I hope they give you a good presentation. And please ask as, as we get going and have questions. Um, and as you see on the right, the little disclaimer there, this is a live event. So if you do have any technical um, difficulties, you can type into the GoToWebinar or email Megan and, and we'll try to get you as much assistance as quickly as possible. Um, but we will also record and, and have everything available to you. And just one more slide before I pass it over to, uh, to Mark. Um, I just wanted to say that um, we're doing this event really because of the AHR um, Innovations Award that we were, were given uh, late in 2020, and that should go live soon. And uh, we were kind of um, disappointed that we couldn't go to HR live and, and kind of see all our friends and, and accept the award there, but we have been getting a lot of questions on that. So really to answer all your questions, we, we thought it'd be best to host this type of webinar, and we do want it as interactive as possible. So please type in questions and we will do a Q and A at the end. And also, we are going to be doing a lot more content on the um, HAC energy recovery and a lot of other diverse thermal solutions. So please follow us on, on LinkedIn or your social media of choice and join our email um, list. We promise that we'll have a lot of uh, very good, informative, educational content throughout the year. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, Mark and Devin. Thank you. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Brian, for that intro. That was great. So uh, as we get started, uh, we're going to do uh, an overview, heat pipes, HVAC, AAX demos, case studies, and uh, the pump-assisted split-loop systems. So a little bit about ACT. Uh, we've been in business since 2003. Uh, we have over 155 employees. Uh, there's uh, 83,000 square feet of manufacturing space. We win quite a number of uh, different awards throughout the year. Brian just mentioned AHR 2021. And then uh, annually we rank in the uh, Central uh, Pennsylvania Business Journal as one of the top fastest growing companies to work with in Pennsylvania. Uh, we've won Tibbetts Awards for the Small Business Administration in, uh, and a lot of other different awards. Uh, our goal is to really become probably one of the key and most beneficial thermal um, technology suppliers in the world. So uh, we'll keep aiming towards that. A little bit of uh, background on the markets that ACT addresses. Uh, we are in the power electronics cooling area. We're also in spacecraft thermal control with over 50 million hours on orbit. That's on multiple satellite platforms, so it's quite an achievement for a company our size. We are in the directed energy weapons area, embedded computing, uh, sea, land, and air and space. And in the industrial segment, uh, we have uh, uh, photonics, which is like laser cooling. Uh, we're in the medical part of uh, like uh, health devices and so on. And in transportation, in energy, we're uh, on large uh, wind turbines and temperature calibration for uh, approximate uh, ovens and other things to uh, do calibration of high temperature ovens. And then in the HVAC area that we're talking about today, we're gonna talk about energy recovery, but mainly in the air to air heat exchanger area. And then we also have a, a new line that's been growing pretty well, which is electronic uh, enclosure coolers that are completely sealed. So if you're interested in those, you can contact us and we'll talk about those as well with you. 
Uh, first thing I'd like to talk about is that the main thing that makes these products work in the HVAC space is the uh, heat pipe. And the heat pipe is an envelope, a copper envelope, and inside of that heat pipe is a working fluid. And the working fluid in this case happens to be R134A refrigerant. And these devices are thermosiphons, so that we always must have, in most instances, you gotta have the hot air stream lower than the cold air stream, because these systems are gravity aided. So this is the heart of all of the different heat exchangers that we make, whether it's a wraparound or an air-to-air -air system. So what happens on one end is that the hot air stream takes the refrigerant, turns it into a vapor, comes down to the condensing end, the colder air stream, travels back as a liquid. And this two-phase process makes a standard heat pipe about a thousand times better thermal conductor than copper. So you can imagine a standard refrigeration coil with up to sometimes 500 of these tubes in there. Each one of those tubes has a potential capacity of 500 watts. You can turn that into BTUs, so that's thousands of BTUs as well. Sorry about there, just a little lag as, uh, as I'm going through the slides. And there you can actually see the, uh, the gas going from a gas to a liquid inside of the heat pipe. So heat pipes applied to HVAC systems. So we have a number of different approaches. Uh, we have what we call our wraparound, which is basically or essentially used in a, a DOAS system to where you have 100% outside air. And so our first uh, heat exchanger coil is what we call our pre-cool coil. And then that wraps around the cooling coil and then we reheat on the other side. So as the hot air comes into the facility on this pre-cool side, the refrigerant boils, so we're taking away heat. So now the cooling coil doesn't have to work as hard. And then with air conditioners, who would know that you have to actually reheat the air to re-dry it and bring it into a nice dry neutral to the space. So we can do these systems in either a pipe to pipe, or we're gonna also be talking about split loop systems today where they can be separated by some tens of feet if needed. And in this case, the wraparound now, instead of having individual pipes, there is a liquid line on the bottom and a vapor line on the bottom for each row where you'd have multiple tubes per row. Now you just have a single liquid line and vapor line. And then the coils actually flow vertically instead of classic coils, which flow horizontally. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get through it. But today's focus is on the air-to-air -air energy recovery systems. So again, we can have systems that are next to one another, and those would be pipe to pipe. And there's always an incoming and an exhaust stream, and they're always in counter flow because that helps the effectiveness level so you can get more heat transfer when you're in counter flow. Or we can go with this split loop system again where we can be some tens of feet apart or close, close together. The nice part about these split loop systems is it does offer us an opportunity to turn the actual energy recovery off by simply putting a valve in here and we'll show you some of those applications coming up. How do we work with customers? Well, we work with our customers in three different ways. We can do retrofits in the field. Sometimes our representatives out there uh, have air handlers. And so what they'll do is they'll send in the air handler and we will do the factory install here and then send it off to the site. Or if you are uh, working with a specific air handler manufacturer, we uh, brought our products to a number of OEMs that if I mention them, you'd know them because they're very common names people like uh, Train and, and, and so on, Johnson Controls and, and the like. So yes, here's why that uh, we're a green energy, because essentially these devices work passively in most of the applications. And there's less energy consumption since they're doing it all passively between the hot air stream and the cold air streams. We're transferring that energy passively through the heat pipes. We also optimize energy recovery because these days, trying to keep your building uh, a healthy building is you're now required by, by most, some ASHRAE standards to increase the number of air exchanges per hour. So as you're doing that, your energy costs are going up, but you're also keeping 
the people inside the building healthy, whether it's a hospital, a lab, a school, a work building. So by having our type of energy recovery, you can capture that heat or that cool leaving the building and do either pre-cooling or preheating, even though you're required to do more air exchanges. So that's really helpful in this day and age as uh, we're trying to keep everybody healthy within a building. So let's talk about pipe to pipe and split loop air to air systems. The nice part about these systems is as large as you can build a uh, standard refrigeration coil or one of our vertical split loop coils, you can build a system. So you can have units as little as uh, 10,000 CFM or 100,000 or 200,000 CFM if you can fit it into a building. Uh, really, everything is designed to fit to your custom needs. And uh, again, as long as you have a coil that can be built to that size, we can engineer it and make a system. And the beauty of our systems is that there is no cross-contamination. So between the exhaust airstream and the exiting airstream, you don't have any potential crossing of whatever's leaving the building or coming into the building. So that is one really nice feature about heat pipe heat exchangers. And they also help meet a lot of the requirements in the ASHRAE standard 62 to, to uh, 2010 for ventilation and acceptable indoor air quality. And a lot of that has to do with air exchanges, as I've mentioned earlier. So what's the difference between the pipe to pipe and the split loop? Well, your standard pipe to pipe systems are here on the bottom. And when you specify a pipe to pipe system, we already pre-camp the units. So even though the casings may be completely level, the inside uh, configuration is at a slight tilt. So your hot air stream flow always has to be lower than your cold air stream. If it's reversed, the system doesn't operate. Um, you can also put them in a vertical situation so that the hot air stream again needs to be on the bottom. But when Devin Pelican comes up and he talks about these systems, we can do a pumped version of this. So now you can use a vertical unit in both summer and winter where this would have to be specific to the season. And sometimes you might have a roof curve where you would like to use these. So if you have an air handler sitting on top of this, you can do pre-cooling or preheating depending upon how you set this system up. The nice part about the split loop thermostipens is that they are season independent. So if you have a hot air stream coming in this right hand unit and now it's winter time and you have a cold air stream and they reverse, because they're split loop, they start a thermostipen pump. So the Liquid to refrigerant automatically reverses by season. So that's a big advantage. The other big advantage is they're 100% isolated between the incoming airstream and exhaust airstream. So if you're in a pathogen lab, whatever's happening over here can't possibly get to the, to the other side. Or if you're in a hospital environment or some, something like a nursing home or, or those types of things, these are all very beneficial systems. Even if you're in the correctional facilities, a lot of those types of facilities have issues with the, uh, with the population, with a lot of communicable diseases. So you want to try to keep as much fresh air and isolation between airstreams as possible. So we're going to do the demonstration at the end. So I'm going to continue on and then Devin is going to do the presentation at the end of this. Are we going to do a polling question? Do you think we can do the polling question now? So why don't we go ahead and do that? I can't see it. Okay, the polling question is, which technology do you typically use for your energy recovery? And we put some of the traditional options there as energy wheels, glycol runaround loops, heat pipes, and uh, something else that we didn't include. And I'll also take this time to encourage you that if you haven't put any questions, um, feel free to chat, chat them into the side and we'll make sure we answer them at the end. And if you don't have any questions, feel free to type in anything else you'd be interested in learning about for future webinars. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. So 
one of the other key things, and uh, well, actually, do we have the results? Hold on, we're getting the results. Energy wheels. So a lot of you have questions about energy wheels. So, um, and a lot of you have used energy recovery wheels. So energy recovery wheels are featured here on the top section. And um, the nice part about energy recovery wheels is they do both latent and sensible. Uh, heat pipes are sensible only energy recovery, but in lab applications and hospitals and areas where they really truly fit, uh, the sensible is what you want because you don't want to carry over uh, with a wheel, which can bring up to 15% of the contaminants from one airstream to the other can come through the wheel on its median. So um, the other nice part about our systems is, is that the halves do not have to be equidistant. In other words, one side of the fin length can be 100 inches, and then the other side could be 60 inches. They don't have to be the same size. Or they can be rectangular instead of square. So I know you can take the energy recovery wheel and lay it on its side or kind of half tilt it, but then you get bearing loads and other things that may affect the longevity of that, that wheel. So wheels are excellent, but I think there's a really good place for the heat pipes, especially to try to keep uh, buildings clean and free of uh, contaminants. Here's a couple applications on how these would be used in applications. So here you can see an air-to-air -air or pipe-to-pipe -pipe unit with face and bypass on the end. The nice part about having the face and bypass is I can open up these louvers so that if I do, for some reason, get a freezing condition on these coils and under certain winter conditions, because there's a lot of humidity in the building, I can, for a momentary process, push more air through the face and bypass and allow the coils to heat up enough to defrost if they're getting frost on them. And that you would pick up either through uh, pressure differentiation or just taking temperature measurements if you instrument it. And that's usually done by the building automation system. This was an application that we did several years ago, and there were over uh, 21 of these systems uh, put into this large Samsung Medical Center in Seoul, Korea. And this actually replaced pump loop systems throughout the entire facility. And these were all uh, essentially pipe to pipe systems. There were uh, 19 of those. And you could see they were uh, quite long. I don't know if you could read this number down here, but they were up to 27 feet long. Uh, and then we had some systems that were almost 27 foot long by 12 foot high. And those were split loop systems that we put into the hospital as well. So these systems, as they were put in, probably had about a three, three and a half year payback. And uh, just our side alone was almost three quarters of a million dollars, less the install. So you can imagine in the wintertime, Seoul, Korea gets pretty cold, but you got 70 degrees leaving and it's uh, 10 degrees minus 10 outside. You get a lot of energy recovery fast and payback fast. Here you can see some of the size and scope and scale of uh, what was done in that facility. And just think about 21 of these being wrestled into place and then uh, ductwork being put around them to efficiently do the heat transfer to preheat the air coming into the hospital. Now we're moving to uh, units that are split loop systems. And in this particular application, again, this is quite long. I would imagine this is about 15 feet long. And in the center here, we're isolated and separated. But well, you can see in this center photo, there is a ball valve. Now what these ball valves do is the same thing as the face and bypass did, where they can momentarily turn off the heat transfer between the two coils and allow the coils to uh, momentarily defrost, or you can control the amount of pre-cooling or preheating coming into the building. So a lot of nice features by having these valves put in, and they're installed on the vapor lines, not the liquid lines, because you can see on the bottom here are the liquid lines. The top have valves to control them for the uh, for the energy transfer. And then part of these systems, we provide a standard interface box for the building automation system and the building management system, BMS, or however you want to phrase it, depending upon the engineering team. Uh, these systems are uh, readily interfaceable, and then the uh, algorithm for the building can then come in and control these valves. 
Now I'm going to transfer it to um, Devin Pelican, and he's going to do the rest of the presentation. And I need to stop sharing. Um, hold on, a, hold on a moment. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. In case you didn't believe we're alive, you uh, can see it now. So I'm going to talk to you about all of our active um, two-phase systems that we have for the HVAC industry. Mark was telling you about all of our passive solutions. And when we say passive, there's no energy input needed to be able to transfer energy from one airstream to another. What we're going to talk about here are our products that recently won the Innovation Award for the Green Building category from AHR, which we're very proud of. And these products are either a hybrid between passive and active or fully active systems being pumped all the time. So in general, these, these systems can do all, all season for energy recovery. Like the passive systems Mark was explaining, they're fully customizable. Any oil geometry that can be manufactured by a reputable vendor can be made into one of these heat pipe or pump assisted systems. The ducts are highly versatile, they can be side by side, they can be vertical, they can be fully split. Um, they can be tens of feet apart from each other across a roof building if required. We still maintain zero cross contamination between the exhaust and the supply airstream for those applications that require um, the most amount of pure air that can be provided to the building. And the lowest possible energy consumption, particularly for an active system, I compare these to glycol runner methods in terms of their energy consumption, uh, but they do utilize fractional horsepower pumps. And the way we can do that is we're actively boiling the working fluid as it moves from the hot air stream to the cold air stream. And that boiling process is extremely efficient, and so you don't need a large amount of flow rate transfer a large amount of energy. So where you may need several horsepower pumps to do a glycol uh, runaround move for your application, our system would be using fractional horsepower pumps, 10 times, sometimes up to 100 times less uh, pumping energy required in order to do the same amount of transport. We have three design options available. So pumped passive in a vertical configuration, it's the one we're showing on the screen here. There's a pump passive split loop where we have the exhaust and supply air coils uh, totally separated from each other, and then a fully pumped split loop system where we're much similar to a glycol runaround loop, totally pumping from one coil to the other in all seasons. So let's go through those options. First is uh, our vertical pump passive energy recovery system. And in the animation you're seeing on the right here, we have our hot air stream on the bottom. So for summer, uh, the supply coil would be on the bottom. And we're boiling the working fluid inside of this system, vapors naturally rising up to the top, where it is cooled by the exhaust airstream in the summer application, and then the liquid falls back down. So this is passive. This is what we call a thermosiphon. Energy is being transferred from the bottom airstream to the top airstream with no moving parts required. This would be applicable for situations where you have an energy wheel, where you have your airstreams right on top of each other or right next to each other. And these applications uh, work quite well. They're highly customizable. Like Mark mentioned before, they don't need to be square to fit into your application like an energy wheel would. These can be any aspect ratio that's required. And for half of the year, they operate like we're showing here in passive mode. And then when you have winter mode where your supply air on the bottom, let's say, is colder, then your exhaust air leaving the building, we need to pump. And so we turn on fractional horsepower pumps to take that cold liquid coming out of the supply coil, pump it back up to where the exhaust coil or the hot coil is so it can vaporize, fall down, condense, and repeat the cycle. So for half the year, you have totally free energy recovery. The other half of the year, you require some act active um, electrical energy, fractional horsepower pumps. And these systems, we've made them in up to 25,000 CFM. They could be bigger. And they pay back in less than two years in most uh, applications. Another configuration of these pump systems is what we call a pumped passive split loop energy recovery system. 
So these are passive in half the year, like the previous example, but pumped in the other half of the year. But the coils are totally separated from each other. So let's take the summer case where we have a passive operation. The supply coil would be physically below relative to the exhaust coil. So if you're on a, a roof with some elevation, the supply air handler would be lower than the exhaust air handler or within six inches of level of each other. And the uh, energy inside of the supply coil is boiling the working fluid, the vapor is naturally rising, heading to the exhaust coil where it condenses and falls back down to the supply coil. So this is just like a regular split fluid thermosiphon, passive operation all throughout the summer. In the winter application, your supply coil is older than your exhaust coil, and so we don't have gravity to help us out anymore. And so we use a small pump with a three-way valve. So now we have our vapor being generated up in the exhaust coil. Vapor gets pushed around to the supply coil where it condenses into liquid, and we have a pump that pumps it back up to the exhaust coil, and we can completely it. So for half the year, we require the pump, the other half the year. One of the limitations of our split loop technology is that we require the fin heights to be no larger than 36 inches, and that's just to get high efficiency boiling inside of our coil. Any coil heights that are larger than 36 inches, we tend to split and stack two units or more above each other. But we still can do hundreds of feet of separation between the two coils if necessary, even in passive mode, if we design the system properly with all those inputs at the beginning. If there's an application where we absolutely can't stack multiple coils on top of each other, or for cost reasons, we don't wanna do that, we have a fully pumped option. So this is one set of pumps with some three-way valves where in the winter, we pump one direction around the loop, and in the summer, we pump the opposite direction around the loop. Coils tend to require multiple sets of headers, but this overcomes our 36 inch maximum fin height restriction because we're actively pumping the liquid through the coil. We don't rely on gravity and buoyancy effects to, to fully wet the coil. So we get away from that 36 requirement, maintain all the benefits of the previous coils with the exception of requiring pumping all year round. But again, these are fractional horsepower pumps compared to um, single digit or multiple tens of horsepower pumps you would need for a glycol runner only of an equivalent size. And so these systems offer the most amount of energy recovery that you could do with the least amount of net energy consumption. All of these systems uh, come with active controls that can be tied into the building management system, like Mark was mentioning. There's many different ways we can do this. This is not a standard um, for us. We are highly customizable to whatever your building management needs are. In most applications, we try to make it as simple as possible, where the voting management system just needs to provide an on-off signal. And then we basically turn off the, or on the pumps according to what the voting management system. We can turn on or off any number of these pumps at any given time to give you more or less energy recovery, or we can shut the system down entirely for defrost if needed or anything in between. So it's fully customizable, and we try to integrate with most big major voting management system manufacturers that are on board. Finally, we wanted to just give you an example of how these systems pay back. Uh, this is an opportunity we did for Lehigh University. You can see an example of the coil on the top here. This happened to be about a 25,000 CFM coil. This is our vertical pump assisted design. So we had a supply coil on the bottom and an exhaust coil on the top separated from each other. And then we had a drain pan integrated into the top coil to collect condensate in the winter. All of the pumping components you can see are mounted at the bottom here with an integrated control box that synced up with their energy with, um, building management system. This was actually a retrofit replacement for an energy wheel solution they had had in their application previously that was failing. Uh, we proposed this new technology to give them a maximum amount of cost savings and the system is estimated to pay back for them within two years. It provided a, a low maintenance solution a direct retrofit for what they already had in their system uh, with the best technology that's out there today. And we often will do these bin analyses for any location um, that needs this technology, where we'll estimate the amount of hours per year spent at different temperatures, estimate your energy savings that could be had uh, with the system, and then predict what the cost savings will be. You can see it varies throughout the year as the temperatures become more or less favorable for energy recovery. But as a net gain, uh, these systems pay back. And if you're interested in more information about this particular case study, you can find it on our website, uh, 1-act.com slash
Before we get into some questions, I think we'll just do a quick live demo here of an uh, energy recovery system we have in the room. So if you bear with us for just one second. Now we're going to do a little demo. Here we have a test setup that shows the performance of our air to air heat exchangers. These are our pipe to pipe products. This happens to be a vertical configuration where we have a simulated supply air stream on the bottom and a simulated exhaust air stream on the top. The supply air is being uh, flowed from left to right in this image and the exhaust is coming from the opposite direction. So we have a cross flow situation. This is an active demo right now. So we are actively heating the air coming in from the supply side. So we're simulating a summer environment. If you can read this, this says 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the air temperature entering our air to air heat exchange. For the exhaust side, we have just the room air. It happens to be about 74 degrees Fahrenheit in our room right now. So we're exhausting 74 degrees Fahrenheit air across the other side of the coil. So what we're seeing is that the supply air is being cooled down by the exhaust air through our heat pipe heat exchanger here from 94 degrees Fahrenheit down to 81. The maximum amount of temperature difference we had available was 94 to 74, so 20 degree uh, available temperature difference. And we're cooling down about 12 degrees. So we're getting about a 60% uh, effectiveness for this coil right here. And then you can see we're heating up the exhaust there, as you'd expect, from 74 up to 89 degrees. So you can see how the temperatures across the system work. This is a totally passive system. So this is a heat pipe heat exchanger operating in a vertical configuration. This is typical for applications. It could be a direct replacement for an energy wheel that would normally be in this application, uh, but this does the same thing without any moving parts. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the demo, Devin, and thanks for the presentation, both of you. And we have had some questions coming in, so let's, uh, let's jump right in. The uh, first one we had come in was, how does the efficiency of a heat pipe compare to a glycol runaround loop? Um, and I think they're interested in both the, the pumped assisted version and the, the passive version, a completely passive version. I think we might have missed the beginning part of that question, but I believe it was comparing a pump assisted split loop to a glycol runaround loop. Is that correct? Okay, and the second question, how does the efficiency of a heat pipe compare to a glycol runaround loop? Devin, you want to take that one? Sure. Typically, we can achieve uh, effectiveness in similar, if not better, than glycol runaround loops. Um, a lot of the same technology is being utilized, circulating a fluid from one coil to the next. The difference in our applications is that we're allowing that fluid to boil. And so we can pick up a lot more energy with a lot less flow rate. And so we can move fluid at a fraction of the flow rate that a glycol runaround system would be moving it at. So what that means practically is pumps that could be massive in size, several horsepower or tens of horsepower pumps. We can shrink them down to much smaller fractional horsepower pumps. That helps with packaging inside of tight uh, applications. And it helps with uh, a lot of pumping power and net energy recovery um, for your system. And it also, because we allow our system to boil, it allows us the opportunity to do part of the year passively, like I was explaining, for our pumped passive system. So we don't need to be running those pumps all the time. That helps with maintenance. It helps with the lifetime. Um, it helps with a lot of applications um, in terms of reliability and energy sync. So they're all around, tend to be um, better systems in terms of energy recovery and, um, and reliability. Yeah, I've been in my care of buildings. The Samsung Medical Center was one of them where they had a glycol loop system. And uh, there were probably five independent glycol loops, not to mention the plumbing that's involved, right? I mean, it can get quite extensive. And if you get a leak, you know, God help you, it's, that glycol is going to be everywhere. So, uh, yeah, some advantages and disadvantages of those systems. Plus, the effectiveness levels are pretty good with our product. It's, it's equivalent, if not better, in some, some cases. We also had a follow-up question in regards to a comparison to the glycol loop. And the question was, how does the air side pressure drop compare between heat pipes and glycol? Very similar, um, if, if not identical. The coils are, are very similar in terms of thin pitch um, and thickness that we're using. A lot of times, actually, we might have lower 
um, pressure drop because we're not using as many rows as a glycol run around loop will use. If we use more than eight rows um, in a coil, it's an extremely large system for us. So we typically have um, coils that are not as deep as glycol run around loops and our pressure drops are equivalent if not lower. Yeah, typically uh, under an inch to an inch or a little bit more than an inch water. Yeah. 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 CFM. Yep. Very good. I think we have a question from um, our poll where many people said they were using the energy wheel. How does price and payback period compare between heat pipe and energy wheel? Those systems are uh, pretty pretty uh, competitive by CFM, but CFM is kind of a, a lost leader because there's a lot of things that go into the cost or price dollar per CFM. But I would I would say that we would be as as we, our pricing is, is equivalent to the wheel, if not better in some cases. So uh, you just it's just by application, it's it's really hard to pay. I mean, sometimes we're cheaper, sometimes they're they're less. It's all application based. I wish I could be more specific, but but that's a tough question to pay. Okay. Next question is, what is the percentage increase in capacity from a passive refrigerant coil versus a pump enhanced refrigerant coil? The, the increase in capacity is, is not really the metric. We, we are, we're pumping almost an equivalent amount of flow, maybe just a little bit more than the passive system would do on its own. And that's intentional. And that's so that we're not using as much pumping power as, um, as we possibly could trying to minimize that. And so the passive system is circulating just by its uh, natural circulation that's required to boil the fluid and we're pumping at very, very similar rates. We don't wanna be pumping too much liquid around the loop because then we're just doing um, single phase uh, energy exchange between the two coils and that's not the goal. So it's it's fairly comparable in terms of um, mass flow rate or volumetric flow rate of refrigerant when it's pumped or passive. Yeah, the other nice thing too, you're not stressing those pumps and they have a high NTBF too as well. So they're going to last for many, many years. And in the event you do have to replace a pump, there's facilities already put in there that they can be put in and out without having to drain the system down. So that's another nice feature about, about the way it's constructed and the way Devin and the team have designed it. Excellent. Next question is, are there any <clears throat> outdoor air temperature limits for passive heat exchangers? No, there aren't. Um, most of our applications utilize R134A for a low warming potential equivalent. Um, for applications that are maybe not, um, let's say, human comfort cooling, where you would be restricted to 110, 120F, we also do some industrial process cooling with these same types of heat exchangers. And in those cases, we may change the working fluid to something that's a little lower pressure at higher temperatures. But we've developed systems up to um, 300 degrees C. For, um, it's the same technology, just a different working fluid and different pressures. So there's really no restriction. Um, any application that you want to exchange energy from one process to another, we have a solution for it. Yeah, the R134A is a nice working fluid because even at 120 degrees, its pressure is relatively low. So uh, it's even better when you're in the 90s and so on. So. It's a very suitable working fluid for the HVAC products. And next, I think we have a couple questions on the split loop designs. The first one is, what is the maximum distance between ducts that you could use a passive split loop? That's a good question. Yeah, we've, we've had some success in the field over 15 feet. But again, if you need to go longer distances, uh, we can increase the size of the pipe. So just to increase our transport capability. So, I mean, it's pretty much if you come to us with a specification, we can probably match it with the right type of coil. Do you agree, Devin? I, I agree, and I'll even go over that we're working on application right now that's got about 150 feet yeah. of separation um, between the supply and the exhaust coil. Um, and that's in passive mode. This happens to be a pumped passive system. So we are pumping half the year, but half the year we're traveling 150 feet nice. um, with a passive setup. So. Any um, is is reasonable, so we'll we'll take a look at all of them. 
And the other question on split loops is, do they have lower efficiency? Are the pipes insulated and do you lose efficiency from the long adiabatic section if the ducts are very spread apart? That's a good question. Um, the, ans the answer is yes. If you don't insulate the piping across your rooftop, let's say, particularly if it's 150 feet, um, that's a lot of surface area for energy to leave the coil. Depending on how much energy recovery the system's doing as a whole, that'll, that'll tell you how much is, is really going to be lost to the environment. In the applications we've seen recently, it's, it's somewhat negligible with reasonable amount of pipe insulation on there. You'd be doing this for a bike ball runaround loop anyway. Um, so we're not asking the, the end user to do anything unusual in, in terms of insulating between the two coils. Um, and you're not going to lose any more energy than you would with, uh, with the traditional system piping across a rooftop. So it's a, it's a concern. It's a design constraint for sure. But it's, um, it's not something that's going to totally nullify the effect of the heat exchanger. Yeah, the other nice thing, again, is you have controllability by row where it would be a lot more difficult if you had a runaround loop because you have one main pipe that's, uh, that's going to those different heat exchangers. So we can, we can modulate what's coming out of those air-to-air -air units very efficiently. Very good. I think we have time for just a couple more. <clears throat> so the next question we have is what is the pressure inside the, the heat pipe heat exchanger and what is the liquid rate for the split pump systems? The pressure is when we're using R134A as the working fluid, don't typically get above 200 PSI, typically around 150 PSI, somewhere in that range. Um, the leakage rate is extremely small. We, we're a heat pipe manufacturing company, we, we design and build um, heat pipes regularly. And these products are intended to last for tens of years. And so these systems that we're developing, um, most of our passive systems are UL certified for the pressure containment, and they maintain their, their fluid charge over the lifetime of the product. And so there is no need for the end user to have to top these systems off with refrigerant or anything like that. Yeah, it was interesting. One of the projects that we commissioned, the uh, facilities people said, where do we put the Freon in? <laughs> And we said, no, you don't touch it. Just it runs and it goes. So that's right. Turnkey solution. That's yep. what we sell. So that was funny. That was always a, that's always an interesting question when you get asked that. And I think we'll do one more question and, and let everyone get back to their, their day a little early here. Um, someone asked if you could expand on how the how the systems are delivered. Do they arrive fully functional to the to the site? It's a good question. Yeah, we, uh, that's why we introduced it in the beginning there, where we had three ways that we work with folks. Uh, sometimes you'll have uh, restrictions. Let's say you have a rooftop application and uh, you don't have a crane and the elevator's only so large. Well, you can't ship a system that's completely together if your elevator is 80 inches tall and you have a 120-inch coil. So in that case, uh, sometimes you would have to separate the system or uh, compartmentalize it that you can get it into the building and then you actually do the brazing, charging, uh, nitrogen purging and all that on site. But typically if your installation allows and you have the room and the heat exchanger uh, can get into the spot that it's uh, supposed to be in, uh, they come ready to go. Or if it's one of those that it has to be plumbed on site and uh, charged on site, we have uh, staff here to come out and do that or we can work with local contractors under supervision. So uh, there's a lot of ways that we can help you install these systems. Excellent. So with that, that'll conclude our, our first webinar of 2021 and our first fully live webinar. So thank you for uh, joining us and thank you for living through some of the growing pains. <laughs> we promise it'll be a little more uh, streamlined next time. Also wanna thank our presenters and uh, Q&A answers, Devin and Mark. Thank you for uh, a lot of the effort that you put in here and the behind the scenes, Megan and Brittany for putting everything together. And thank you for all for joining us. If, if any questions were not answered live, we will send emails with, with the requested information. And please feel free to send us more requests, um, more questions, and we'll definitely get those back to you as well. And one final note, if you have any other requests for 
<clears throat> additional learning sessions or things we could provide to you in the future that would be helpful as you design these systems into your projects, please let us know and we'll go ahead and uh, put content together around it. So thank you all and uh, keep, keep following ACT and let us know how we can help you. Thanks a lot.